Yes, it is recording. Okay, with the help of God, we are going to talk about conditional and unconditional salvation in history. Uh, for this sermon, I'm going to take a verse of the Bible in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 26. Amen. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Um, Bible says, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much more words, of how much words punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, notice he was sanctified by the by the blood of the covenant um, in which we were sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. Amen. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again the Lord will judge his people. His people. Amen. It is fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. So these verses of the Bible that we have read here, Hebrews, which was written after the death of Paul and before the destruction of the temple in Israel, Hebrews, and it was written in order to uh, teach the Hebrew Christians who were in the um, scatter, amen, that Christianity was true. Amen? And uh, the writer, some people say that it was Barnabas and other, other people say that it was Paul. I, in my case, I don't believe that it was Paul, right? But it was written just to let them know not to go back to the Moses uh, rituals and sacrifices and believe again in what they have led because of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen? So, we have an extensive debate in the interpretation of these verses of the Bible. Some say that it doesn't mean that some people fall, uh, fall away or backslide. No, that it, it is speaking about people who didn't know the Lord. So they say, right? But the, the Bible is clear in saying that trample the Son of God underfoot count the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. He was, the person was sanctified. Amen? It means that person was born again. And now this person sinned will, willfully. Amen? After he has received the knowledge of the truth, Bible says, and has insulted the spirit of grace, there is no more sacrifice for those sins. It means that after this is just the wrath of God of these people. Amen? And we are going to see how the early church fathers used to interpret this verse of the Bible and how they used to preach about this topic. It was conditional salvation. Amen? Let us see the first, for example, the term of losing salvation was common in the early church. For example, Cyprian of Carthage, it was a, he wrote some treatise, and in 250 A.D., right? And he says, "To whom that is born and dies, is there not a necessity at some time to leave his country and to suffer the loss of his state? But let not Christ be forsaken." so that the loss of salvation and of eternal home should be feared. Notice, the word, the term, loss of salvation was common in the early church. 
Because they knew that some people used to leave the congregation and also abandon the faith and also abandon Jesus Christ. Amen? And the reasons were many. I'm going to select four reasons in this uh, sermon. For example, another, uh, another writer uh, in, this, in this case was John Chrysostom. He was the bishop in Constantinople. It means a minor Asia. And he wrote concerning that people used to abandon his own salvation. And he says, this is another term, abandoning salvation. And it is referred also in the book of John, chapter 15, verse 5, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, it is a conditional sentence. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But verse 6, there is another condition, and it is a warning um, uh, on the danger of losing salvation. In verse 6 says, if you do not remain in me, and he's speaking to his disciples, 11 disciples, because in that upper room, just some hours before, Judas Iscariot had left the Lord and didn't remain in the Lord. And that's why the Lord says, if you disciples do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Amen. So that's why John Chrysostom wrote, for the soul when... Once it has abandoned his own salvation, will no longer perceive that it is plunging downwards to sin, to do and say everything which is adverse to his own. Amen. Abandon salvation. Just the Gnostics used to believe that salvation cannot be lost in the ones who were chosen because the Gnostics were the ones who began to introduce within Christianity that term that salvation belongs that just through a group of people who were chosen. In the cases of origin of Alexandria and uh, he wrote in 225 DC that these Gnostics used to trust Romans chapter 9 to say that there are two kinds of people in this world. The ones who have a, a, um, a, a spiritual nature and the ones who have an evil nature. The ones who, are, who have that spiritual nature are the ones who are elected. Amen? And that nature is awake or resurrected by the knowledge. And knowledge in Greek is gnosis. By the Gnosis, they were resurrected. And they are the ones who will be saved. And they, it is impossible for them to lose that salvation, according to the Gnostics. It is what uh, Origen wrote. A certain of those, it means the Gnostics, who hold different opinions, misuse or twist these passages of the scripture, speaking about Romans 9, themselves also almost destroying free will by introducing ruined natures incapable of salvation and others of them saved which it is impossible can be lost. Amen? It is clear. It is like uh, origin where is speaking today and saying to the ones who preach that it is impossible to lose salvation in the ones who are elected. The same thing. Amen? And we, this is the introduction, and we are going to focus in four main reasons why the early fathers, the early church fathers, used to preach warnings on the danger of falling away and lose the salvation. Four reasons. The first one, why they wrote to warn the congregation and the members about losing salvation. Why they do? They did it. It is for four reasons. Number one, because of God's rejection after faith's denial. 
caused by the constant threatening of martyrdom, loss of properties, and imprisonment. Amen? Because of the persecutions. And the second one is a deterrent, deterrent to pride which could ultimately lead to sin and apostasy if believers could be kept in a state of worry and doubt then they would be less likely to drift away from the faith because of inattentiveness the third it was the belief that sins committed after baptism without repentance could not be forgiven. And the fourth, because of biblical evidences of the ones who began well but ended bad. We are going to focus in these four main reasons why the writers or early church fathers used to warn the congregations and, uh, uh, and the Christians all over because it was not in one part of the Christianity. It was in the, in the, in the West, it means the Greek fathers, it was in the Cappadocian fathers in the a minor Asia. It was also in the Western fathers. It means Latin fathers. All of them had this in common. They believed that Christians were able to lose their salvation if they neglected it. Amen? Let us see the first point. Because of God's rejection, it, they wrote one in the congregation that Christians were able to lose salvation because and that's why they wrote because of God's rejection after faith's denial caused by the constant threatening of mar martyrdom loss of property and properties and imprisonment amen for example by the year 60 AD Demas who was a preacher and a fellow worker of Paul, according to Philemon and Colossians. Um, why I am saying to you this? Because when Paul was arrested in Acts chapter 28, he remained in prison two years. In these two years, he wrote four letters. Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon. These four wonderful letters from prison. And in two letters, he mentioned one fellow worker and it was Demas in 60 Demas was a preacher and a fellow worker of Paul for example Philemon chapter 1 verse 24 Paul uh, greeted uh, and sent, uh, uh, dismissed the letter saying as do Mark Aristarchus Demas look my fellow workers Demas was a preacher close to Paul amen in Colossians 14 says, Look, the beloved physician sends you his greetings, and also Demas. They were in the same position of Luke, they were preachers. But after he was released, Paul he went to the other missionary work, uh, and he, uh, many supposed that he went to Spain to preach. Amen. And the Bible says, that when he was in Troas, according to 2 Timothy, he was arrested by Nero, the emperor. And he was arrested and he was judged in Rome and he was about to die. It was five years after he wrote those letters. And in that letter, Paul wrote to Timothy saying that Demas, amen, because of the threat of mar martyrdom, he preferred to abandon Paul and he preferred to love his own life rather than the life of Jesus Christ. And that's why in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, Paul says, For Demas, having loved this present world or age in Greek, amen, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Amen. The Apostle John warned the churches of Asia and those who prefer to love this world to avoid martyrdom don't have God's love. They are lost. And that's why in John, 1 John chapter 2, 15 says, Do not love the world nor the things 
in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boast or the pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world. And the world is passing away and also it's lost. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. Demas abandoned Paul in order to love this world, this life. And that's why he lost his salvation. Amen. It is clear in the scripture, right? John 12, 25, Jesus said, He who loves, he loves his life, loses it. it. It means lose his life that the Lord gave him for salvation. Because he preferred to win his own life in this world. But he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. Clear, right? And that's why John Chrysostom wrote that Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world and is departed to Thessalonica saying that is having loved his own easy and security from danger. He has chosen rather to live luxuriously and at home in, in, in his own house than to suffer hardships with me and share my present danger of martyrdom. Amen. He has blamed, he has blamed him alone, not for the sake of blaming him, but to confirm us that we may not be effeminate in declining toils and dangers, for this is having loved this present world. Amen. This is the interpretation of John Chrysostom. Amen. The message in the early church was this. If you deny the Lord because you don't want to suffer martyrdom or to be a martyr, amen, for Jesus' sake, you lose your salvation. This is the message of the early church. This is the message. Those who deny the Lord for love in this life and fear to die for Jesus' sake will lose their life in eternity. It was what the constitution of the holy apostles wrote. It was written in 375 to 380 AD and it says if you are called to mar martyrdom with constancy to confess his precious name and if on this account we are punished let us rejoice and hastening to immortality. But now, by confessing a good confession, we not only save ourselves, but we confirm those who are newly illuminated and strengthen the faith of the catechumenists or the, the ones, the beginners. But if we remit any part or omit any part of our confession and deny godliness, by the faintness of our persuasion and the fear of a very short punishment, a very short punishment, we not only deprive ourselves of everlasting glory, but we shall also become the causes of perdition of other, others and shall suffer double punishment. Amen? And it says, for if a person by the denial of his own hope, which is Jesus, the Son of God, should be delivered from a temporary death, and the next day should fall dangerously, dangerously sick upon his bed, and has sudden catastrophe, and departs this life, is not he deprived of the things present, and loses those eternal, it means that he loses his own salvation. Or rather he is within the verge of eternal punishment and goes into the outer darkness where is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Citing Matthew chapter 8 verse 12. Was clear, right? It was clear. Those who prefer to deny the Lord, because remember that in those persecutions, Amen? They used to threaten the Christians. 
Just deny Christ and you will be saved. It means we are not, you will not be killed by be burning. It was the case of Polycarp, the disciple of John. When he was 80 something years old and he was about to die. And the one, the executorness or the ones who were going to kill him with the fire in, the, in their hands said, Deny Jesus and you will be free. And he says, I am going to deny Jesus if he has done to me good in these 80 years. Put the fire and send me to heaven. Can you praise the name of Jesus? But many people, by fear of martyrdom, they, they used to, to, to deny the Lord and to flee uh, to other places. Amen. And that's why they wrote, the Christian the church father wrote, that if you deny the Lord for the fear of dying for Christ, you will lose your salvation, and when you die, you will be double punished. Amen? It is, it is clear, right? For example, the disciple of Polycarp, John's disciple, affirmed, it means Irenaeus, a film that some Christians used to fly away from Christ in order not to suffer martyrdom. It means when he says to fly away, it means to abandon Jesus, abandon eternal life. It means abandon his own salvation. And that's why they used to get lost after knowing the Lord. Amen? If, however, he was himself not to suffer, but should Fly away from Jesus. Why did he exhort his disciples? It means Jesus exhorted his disciples. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose shall find it. John 12, 25, I quoted already. And that his disciples must suffer for his sake. For this purpose did he give them this ex exhortation. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to send both soul and body into hell. Matthew 10, 28. Thus exhorting them to hold fast those professions of faith which they had made in reference to him. For he promised to confess before his father those who confess his name before men. But declared that he would deny those who should deny him and would be ashamed of those who should be ashamed to confess him. It was clear, right? Amen? It was clear. Mark, Matthew chapter 10 verse 33 said, But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him uh, before my father who is in heaven. Origin also of Alexandria wrote, He who has not denied himself but denied Christ will experience the saying, I also will deny him. It was a real message. Condition, conditional salvation was Pauline doctrine. That's why he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, when he was about to die, because he knew that the time of his departure was near, that God was going to give him a crown of glory. Amen? And he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, it is trustworthy statement, for if we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless or unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Some Calvinists use this text and says, if we deny him, if, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. It means that he remains faithful to us, that he will save us in no, in, 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 no matter if we deny him. No, he remains faithful to himself, not to the unfaithful. Because the unfaithful, Bible says in Luke chapter 12, verse 46, that the unfaithful will be put with the unfaithful ones in the outer darkness, according to Matthew, uh, uh, Luke. Amen? 
The early theologians thought that the unfaithful servant or bishop or priest, pastor, will be more punished than the others because he knew God's will. As John Chrysostom affirmed, the man's virtue, which makes the fault also greater, for all things are not judged alike in all men. For mighty men, it is said, shall be mighty tormented. And he that knew his Lord's will and doeth it not shall be beaten with more stripes or many stripes, according to Luke 12, 47, what I have quoted already. So that more knowledge is a crown of more punishment. For this same reason, the pastor, if he commit the same sin as those under government in means of the congregation, shall not have the same to endure, but things far more grievous or more stripes. Amen? Are you getting the point? So, the pastors will be, will be the servants pastors, bishops, evangelists, amen, and those who proclaim apostles will be more punished than the, the congregation if they don't repent and live in sin, amen. So it was clear the message, right? Not only martyrdom was the cause of pastors to deny the faith, but also the love of money. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, greediness and pierced themselves through, many, through with many sorrows. It means some have gone astray from the faith. It means some have backslided. Amen? because of love of money. And that's why John Chrysostom wrote, I therefore exhort to lay to heart the exceeding unseemliness hereof, and to flee from idolatry. For so doth Paul name covetousness, that kind of idolatry. And to flee not only covetousness in money, but that in evil desire, and that in clothing, and in food, and that in everything else, since the punishment we, we shall have to suffer if we obey not God's laws is much severer. For he says, the servant that knew his Lord's will and did not and did it not shall be beaten with many stripes. With a view then to escaping from this punishment and being useful both to others and to ourselves, let us drive out all iniquity from our soul and choose virtue. Amen? Clear, right? We praise the name of Jesus. Hermas, the pastor, he was a man of God that Paul greeted in his letter of Rome, Romans. He was a man who was living in the province of Rome. In Romans 16, 14 is mentioned. He wrote a wonderful letter and assured that Christians who knew God but remain in sin will be punished more than unbelievers. It means though they, will, they lose their salvation and will be punished worse than the unbelievers. He wrote in the Shepherd of Hermas, book 3, similitude 9th, chapter 18. He says, How, sir, I said, did they become worse after having known God? He that does not know God, he answered, and practices evil, receives a certain chastisement for his wickedness. But he that has no God ought not any longer to do evil, but to do good. If accordingly when he ought to do good, he do or does evil, does not he appear to do greater evil than he who does not know God? Notice, and let us see this, but they who have known God 
and have seen his mighty works and still continuing in evil shall be chastised doubly and shall die forever. In this way, then will the church of God be purified. Clear, right, my brothers and sisters? The second reason why the early church fathers used to warn the Christians the danger of losing salvation is because of this, of a deterrent to pride, which could ultimately lead to sin and apostasy. If believers could be kept in a state of fear and trembling, then they would be less likely to drift away from the faith. Amen? That's why they used to teach that la salvation can be lost in order to keep the congregations and believers in working out in their salvation with fear and trembling. Because if, 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 they, if they would have believed the salvation cannot be lost, pride will come into the hearts of the believers and trust and they began and they they could begin to trust in themselves. Amen. And to lose their salvation. Amen. That's why Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It was the second reason why they wrote to the congregation that salvation can be lost. Amen. Tell me, John Chrysostom wrote, tell me what wouldest thou know that ye, that ye or you give heed to me, but that ye work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? For it is impossible for one who lives devout of fear to set forth any high or commanding example. And he said, not merely with fear, but and with trembling, which is an excessive degree of fear. Such fear had Paul. And therefore he said, I fear, lest having preached to others, I myself should be rejected. And he quoted 1 Corinthians 9, 27. You remember that when Paul, when Paul says that? That he, after he being a flag or banner or a standard for others, and if he didn't submit his own body into subjection, at the end he himself be cast away. Amen? That's why he says it is with fear. Fear was the ground. Fear was the foundation of salvation in order that, that the Christians should take care of their salvation and not to neglect this wonderful salvation. Amen? Paul not only feared for his own salvation, but for the others. For example, in 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve, by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Notice, if salvation were not able to be lost, uh, uh, Paul would have not fear. Amen? But... Because it was possible. That's why Paul says, I fear that Satan could deceive you. Amen? And in verse 2 and verse 1, is speaking about the bride of Christ. Amen? The church. Amen? That's why Tertullian wrote, he was a Latin father. He lived in 160 to 220 AD. He wrote, we ought indeed to walk so holily and with so entire substantially a faith as to be confident and secure in regard of our own conscience, desiring that it may be it may abide in us to the end. Amen. Yet we should not presume, presume that it will, for he who presumes that salvation cannot be lost. Amen. The ones who presumes it feels 
less apprehension. He who feels less apprehension takes less precaution. He who takes less precaution runs more risk to lose his salvation. Amen. Fear is the foundation of salvation. Presumption is the impediment to fear. More useful then is to apprehend that we may possibly fail or lose the salvation than to presume that we cannot. Clear, right, my brothers and sisters? For apprehending will lead us to fear, fear to caution, and caution to salvation. On the other hand, if we presume, there will be neither fear nor caution to save us. <laughs> Wonderful, right? That's why Paul says, work out in your own salvation with fear and trembling. Because if you have the conviction that, that because you were elected and you will never lose the salvation, pride will come into you. And then uh, people neglect their own salvation because they think that because of that knowledge, according to the Gnostics, the Gnosis, after having that knowledge, you are saved, always saved. It is not true. Amen? And this term, always saved, saved, always saved, was introduced within the church in the fourth century by Augustine. You will see later. Amen? Barnabas, Paul's companion, according to Acts 13, verse 2, called also apostolos, or the sent ones, or apostle with Paul, Acts 14, 14, taught to take care of his salvation. Otherwise, Satan can deceive us to cast us away from our salvation. Barnabas, who died in 61 AD, who was a companion of Paul, who knew Paul doctrine. He says, since therefore the days are evil and Satan possesses the power of this world, we ought to give heed to ourselves and diligently inquire into the ordinances of the Lord. For he, the Father, speaks to us, desires the witnesses that we not going astray like them, the Jews. We ought therefore, brethren, carefully to inquire concerning our salvation, lest the wicked one, having made his entrance by deceit, should hold, hold us forth from our true life. Amen? Amen. Calvinists quote John chapter 10, verse uh, 27, 28, that says, My sheep hear my voice, I give them eternal life, and no man will pluck them out from my hand. Will not is future sentence. After death, nobody will pluck. Amen? The souls that have died in the Lord out of the hand of the Lord. No one. Amen? But the previous verses in John 10, Bible says that the, that the pastor who is, how do you call it, salary pastor, the one who, the pastor who is not the, the owner of the ship, when he see the wolf coming, abandon the ship and flee. And the wolf comes and snatch or pluck them out the ship. Because in this life, Satan is able, as Barnabas says, lest the wicked one, having made his entrance by deceit, should hold, hold us forth from our true life. Amen? Amen. Barnabas, as a bold companion, also feared lest somehow the serpent would deceive some Christians and to cast them away from God's kingdom. That's why he wrote also, Take heed, lest resting at our ease, as those who are the cold of God, we should fall asleep in our sins, and the wicked prince, acquiring power over us, 
should thrust, thrust us away from the kingdom of the Lord. Let us be where, let's be found fulfilling that saying. And, and, and it is written, many are called, but few are chosen. Tell me if it is not clear. Barnabas was a companion of Paul. So Paul never preached. Amen? Saved, always saved. Amen? Paul and Barnabas and the early church preached the danger of losing salvation. It is clear. Amen? Let us see. Gnostics were proud by saying that salvation belongs to a group of chosen people who were of a spiritual nature given by the Gnosis, knowledge, by God's mercy, and they will never lose their salvation. On the other hand, the nation belonged to the ones of early, early nature, destined to be hardened by God's by God as Pharaoh. Origin, this writer, theologian, exposes them that eternal security or the one saved, always saved teaching, saying that it really comes from the Gnostics. In interpreting Romans 9, Origin says, Let us begin then with that is said about Pharaoh, that he was hardened by God, that he might not send away the people along with which will be examined also the statement of the apostle. Therefore, has he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will, he will, he hardens. And certain of those, the Gnostics, who hold different opinions misuse these passages or twist these passages themselves also almost destroying free will. Gnostics didn't believe in free will. Calvinists didn't believe in, don't believe in free will. By introducing ruined natures incapable of salvation as the Calvinists believe that we are totally depraved and we have a nature and uh, not capable of salvation. And they also, the Gnostics used to say, and others saved which it is impossible can be lost. And Pharaoh, they say, as being of a ruined nature, it means that he was predestined to be damned. Amen. Is therefore hardened by God, who has mercy upon the spiritual, spiritual, but hardens the earthly. The Gnostics were the ones who used to separate human beings into groups. The ones who are of earthly nature and spiritual nature. The ones who were of spiritual nature were the ones chosen by God to receive salvation. And that salvation, as origin says, it is impossible to, come, uh, to, to be lost. Amen? Are you getting the point? Amen. This heresy of saved, always saved, is coming from the Gnostics. Amen? You will see later how it was introduced within the church by Augustine. Amen? John Cassian, the Roman, he was from the province of, Roman, of Rome, also preferred to fear for losing salvation than to presume that we cannot. He wrote, we must still be careful to strive with all our might to attain for with a spiritual condition, lest happily we flatter ourselves and then become careless and indifferent about purifying ourselves from other affections because we think that we are free from corruption and carnal intercourse and thus we find ourselves in that lukewarm condition which is considered the worst of all and discover that we are spewed out of the mouth of the Lord in accordance with these words of his. I would that thou wert hot or cold, but now thou art lukewarm, I will begin to spew thee out of my mouth. Revelation 3, 15, 16. And not without good reason does the Lord declare that those whom he has 
previously received in his bowels of his love and who had become shamefully lukewarm shall be spewed out and rejected from his bosom. <laughs> you see my brothers and sisters, they used to believe that the ones who flattered themselves saying that they were not going to lose salvation, amen, they become in a state of careless and neglect that salvation and become lukewarm. And the early fathers used to preach that the lukewarm were the ones who were inside of the body of Christ. But the Lord will spew them out from his mouth or vomit them out. Amen? It is clear. Tertullian resisted the Gnostics who used to boast about their unconditional salvation because for them it was impossible to lose salvation. They assured God was under need to grant salvation to them because the fact they were chosen. <laughs> you understand? They used to boast, saying that God was under need to grant salvation. Amen? Because they were chosen. Can I say to you something? It is the ground of the salvation in Calvinist. Why? Because they say that they are saved just because they were chosen. They are saved not because of, by grace, by the sacrifice of Jesus. No. It's because of they were chosen. This is the ground of salvation for them. After being chosen, so Jesus died for the ones who were chosen. But salvation is not for the ones who believe in the sacrifice of Christ. In fact, they say that Believers, uh, the, 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 the unbelievers cannot believe in Christ. Amen? And <laughs> the truly resisted the Gnostics who used to boast about their unconditional salvation because for them it was impossible to lose salvation. They assured or used to preach that God was under need to grant salvation to them because the fact they were chosen. That's why Tertullian wrote and says, Some think as if God were under a necessity of bestowing even on the unworthy that what he has engaged to give, and they turn his liberality into a slavery. But if it is of if it it is of necessity that God grant us the symbol of death, then he does so unwillingly. But who permits a gift to be permanently retained which he has granted unwillingly? Can I say to you something? This is what Calvinist teaches. Calvinist teaches that salvation is given to people who don't want salvation. In other words, that unbelievers who are outside, they don't want the salvation. But God gives the salvation to them by grace. Even if they don't want. If they are not willingly to receive that salvation. You know why? They say that God granted them salvation because they were elected. And that's why God will resurrect them spiritually. And then they, through that irresistible grace, will turn to Christ to believe in Christ and to be justified. But that salvation is given to the unwillingly. Same thing what Tertullian was teaching. Saying, but who permits a gift to be permanently retained with which he has granted unwillingly? In other words, do you give a candy to a boy who is going to say, no, I don't want it? No, you don't compel him. Amen? Neither God. Matthew, Mark 11, 26 says, If you don't forgive your brother's sin, also our Heavenly Father will not forgive you. That's it. God does not compel anyone. Amen? 
For do not many after word after word fall out of grace. Is not this gift taken away from many the gift of salvation? Of course it is. Let no one then flatter himself on the ground of being assigned to the recruit classes of learners as if on that account he has a license even now to sin. <laughs> Amen? Irenaeus also condemned the pride of the ministers who trusted in themselves by believing that because of the fact of being used by God, they were not able to be cast out from God's kingdom. Remember in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, the Bible says that the bishop must not be a novice. Otherwise, he can puff it up or can get pride and fall in the same condemnation of Satan. Amen? And notice, this is speaking about a bishop, a man who is saved. Amen? So, Irenaeus wrote and he says, Christ shall not die again in behalf of those who now commit sin, for death shall no more have dominion over him. From those to whom he hath given most shall he demand most. He ought not, therefore, as the presbyter remarks, to be puffed up, nor be severe upon those of old time, but ought ourselves to fear, lest per perchance after we have come to the knowledge of Christ, if we do things displeasing to God, we obtain no further forgiveness of sins, but be shut out from his kingdom. This is the problem of many pastors. Because we believe that because we are used by God, and we feel the anointing of God by preaching the gospel, or even by laying hands on people and they recover, we think that we are saved. And because of that, we have free access to the kingdom of heaven after death. Not. We cannot trust in ourselves. Amen? We have to fear God and to abandon sins. That's why he says, if we do things displeasing to God, we obtain no further forgiveness of sins, but be shut out from his kingdom. Amen? Can you praise the name of Jesus? The belief of conditional salvation was all over the Christian world and it was taught to flee from sin to avoid the loss of the heavenly rewards. That's why um, this uh, writer, Christian writer, Sulpitius Severus of France, who lived uh, between 363 and 425 AD, who was a contemporary with uh, uh, Augustine, uh, Augustine. Amen? He wrote, For as we must flee from sin to righteousness, so he who has entered on the practice of righteousness must beware lest he lay himself open to sin, for it is written that his righteousness shall not profit the righteous on the day on which he has gone astray. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 24. For this then we must take our stand. For this we must labor that we who have escaped from sins do not lose the prepared rewards. Even salvation. Amen. The third reason, remember we are speaking about four reasons why the writers of the early church used to warn the congregations and Christians about losing salvation. The third reason is because the belief that sins committed after baptism, if the person does not repent, those sins could not be forgiven. Amen? For example, Tertullian says, God hath foreseen also other weaknesses incident to the condition of man. The stratagems of the enemy, stratagems 
or the devices of the enemy. Amen. The 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 deceptive aspect. Excuse. The deceptive aspects of the creatures, the snares of the world. That faith, even after baptism, would be endangered. He saw that most persons, after obtaining salvation, would be lost again. Amen? By soiling the wedding dress, by failing to provide oil for the torches, in the case of the full virgins. Amen? A Christian after the lover or baptism, if he remains in the fornication or sexual sin, lose his salvation. Amen. For example, John Chrysostom wrote, was any guilty of fornication after Christian baptism? In this case, not even a consolation is left for the sin anymore. And this self-same thing Paul declared when he said, he that despised Moses' law dieth without mercy under two or three witnesses. Or how much sorrow punishment suppose ye shall he be counted worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant and holy thing and hath done despite to the grace of the Spirit? Hebrews 10, 28, 29. Hath any being guilty of fornication bearing the elders office now this above all is the crown of evil deeds in other words the pastors who used to commit adultery or fornication they used to lose their salvation amen have any being guilty of fornication bearing the elders office or pastor office now this above all is the crown of evil deeds. It was a general conviction of losing salvation. That's why the constitution of the Holy Apostle written in 390 AD says, He who sins after his baptism, unless he repent and forsake his sins, shall be condemned to hell fire. Clear, right, my brothers and sisters? Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20, speaks about that. Some people, for example, Paul, John Peter, when he wrote Second Peter, he wrote that the false, teach, false teachers were bought by Christ according to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. That Greek word, bought, is the same Greek word that is written in Revelation chapter 5, in the song of the church in heaven. That you bought us, or redeemed us, from every tribe, language, and nation, and had made us priests and, and kings for the Father. That same Greek word, bought us, Peter used that Greek word that the false teachers in chapter 2 of 2 Peter were bought by Christ. But they deny the Lord who bought them, Bible says. And they say also, for example, in verse 20, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, that word pollutions of the world is written also in chapter 1 verse 4 of the same letter saying that the Christians also have escaped from the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ P Peter also used that prognosis that Greek word prognosis that means the right knowledge or the knowledge of the truth notice these false teachers have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as the church also escaped from the pollutions of the world according to chapter 1 verse 2 and 3 in the same word amen these false teachers after have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of Jesus Christ they are again entangled in them and overcome 
the latter end is worse than them than the beginning. Verse 21 says, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. Chapter 2 verse 14 says that they left the right, the right way of the Lord. They have forsook the right way of the Lord, forsaken. Than having no way to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them, but it has happened to them according to the true proverb a dog returns to his own vomit, and a zoe having watched to her wallowing, wallowing in, her, in the mire. And John Chrysostom used that statement of the ones who lose their salvation because they return to the vomit. And he says, as if then we were banqueting, banqueting with Christ himself, or having feast with him, and partaking of his table, it means the communion, let us do nothing at random, let us, but let us pass our time in fastings and prayers and much sobriety, sobriety, sobriety of mind. How do you call it? Sobriety of mind. Because after they have received the kingdom of God, immediately have returned to their former vomit. Quoting Second Peter chapter 2, 22. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20 to 22. And have become more wicked and drawn upon themselves a more severe punishment. Those sins committed after baptism, he suffers a punishment as great as he would he as he would if both the former sins were brought up again and many worse than these. For the guilt is no longer simply equal, but double and tripled. Look, in proof that the penalty of these sins is greater. Hear what Saint Paul says, He that despises, that despised most slow died without mercy, and the two or three witnesses, or how much sorrow punishment suppose ye shall be brought worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant and holy thing, and hath done despite into the spirit of grace. Notice, they used to quote Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28 to 29, to say that salvation can be lost. But the reformers, it means the reformed Christians or Calvinist, Calvinists say that it doesn't mean so. And the early church fathers quoted to mention that salvation can be lost. Amen? Irenaeus was very or pretty sure that sin can separate us from God's kingdom. Amen? He wrote, the apostle says, Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, not effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And as it was not to those who are on the outside that he said these things, but to us, the Christians, lest we should be cast forth from the kingdom of God by doing any such thing. Amen? I have 15 minutes, right? Yes. Okay. Praise to the name of Jesus. Let us see the fourth. Why the early church fathers used to warn the churches about losing salvation. The fourth reason was this. Because of biblical evidences of the ones who began well but ended bad. For example, Solomon. He used to quote Solomon. Not this Solomon, right? He is here. While we are alive, we have hope, right? No, the king, Solomon, right? <laughs> Solomon, Saul the king, you will see later. Amen? Because Calvinist says that the spirit of God is the seal for 
the redemption and, it, and God will never remove the spirit of God from the believers or the ones who are born again let us see what they used to believe amen later amen biblical evidences of the one who began well but ended bad King Solomon retained the grace that he had received from the Lord as long as he walked in God's ways however after he forsook the Lord's way he also lost the Lord's grace clear my brothers and sisters lost the Lord's grace for that reason it is written hold fast that which you have lest another take your crown surely the Lord would not threaten that the crown of righteous might be taken away if it were not that the crown must depart when the righteous the righteousness departs I don't know what these Calvinist people say about this they were Armenians they were heretical Pelagians no Arminius Jacobs Arminius was born in 1700 AD but Cyprian of Carthage it was from the third century even before Augustine the father of Calvinism amen they were not Armenians they were not Pelagians they were Christians followers of Jesus Christ amen so as also we are and we believe also this doctrine amen Cyprian also wrote about the warning of conditional salvation of Azariah the prophet to Asa the king of Israel let us see that even a baptized person loses the grace that he has attained amen unless he keep innocent in the gospel according to John lo you are made whole sin no more lest a worse thing happen unto you also in the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God abides in you if anyone is speaking about Christians violate the temple of God him will God destroy of this same thing in the Chronicles God is with you while you are with him if you forsake him he will forsake you second Chronicles 15 2 it is clear right when Paul says the temple of God is holy but if you destroy the temple God will destroy you speak it's a warning to Christians who are born again and have the Holy Spirit it's not to unbelievers Cyprian of Carthage used to believe salvation can be lost for Cyprian and many others scripture was one of several lines of evidences for the possibility of born Christians to fall away from Christ and lose their salvation for all eternity the Lord admonishing us of this in his gospel and teaching that we should not return again to the devil and to the world which we have renounced and whence we have escaped says let me see no man looking back land putting his hand to the plow is fit for the kingdom of God Luke 9 62 and again let him that is in the field not return back remember Lot's wife we must complete the heavenly and spiritual grace so that we may attain to the pound and the crown in heaven in the book of Chronicles it says the Lord is with you as long as long as you also are with him but if you forsake him he will forsake you also in Ezekiel the righteousness of the righteous man will not deliver him in whatever day that he may transgress furthermore in the gospel the Lord speaks and says he that endures endures to the end the same will be saved amen Basil or Basil of Caesarea the Grecian Bishop of Caesarea Masaka in Cappadocia Asia Minor taught that Judas lost 
his salvation, his righteousness. And he says, Vain is the laborer, the labor of the righteous man, if a change befall and the former turn from the better to the worse. So we hear from Ezekiel teaching as it were in the name of the Lord when he says, If the righteous turneth away and committeth iniquity, I will not remember the righteousness which he committed before in his sin he shall die. One example where surely enough for keeping safe one who is living a godly life, the fall from the better to words of Judas, who after being so long Christ's disciple for a mean gain sold his master and got, and got a halter, halter for himself, let them, brother, that if it is not he who be who begins well, who is perfect. It is he who ends well, who is approved in God's sight. Amen? Amen. John Cassian affirmed that those who lose their salvation are blotting out of the book of life. Huh. Erased from the book of life. Amen? But of course, when God erased someone from the book of life, He's not going to write him again back. He lose his salvation forever. Amen? For example, it doesn't mean that when I commit sin and I fail, for example, David, David committed, committed sin with uh, adultery and killed Uriah the Hittite. It doesn't mean that the Lord erased his name from the book of life. No, he was in danger of losing his salvation. Of course, he deserved to die as the prophet says, but God granted him an opportunity and he didn't neglect that opportunity. And that's why the Lord didn't erase him from the book of life. Amen? Because let me tell you something, just once the Lord erased from the book of life and when the Lord erased someone from the book of life, that person will not be written again in the book of life. Amen? So finally, when the Lord would, would for their speedy fall, turn away his merciful countenance from the people whom he had chosen out of all nations. The giver of the law interposes on their behalf and cries out, I beseech thee, O Lord, speaking about Moses, I beseech thee, O Lord, these people have sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold and now, if thou forgivest their sin, forgive it. But if not, blot me out of thy book which thou hast written. To whom the Lord answered, If any man hath sinned before me, I will blot him out of my book. Exodus 32, 31 to 33. David also, when he complained in prophetic spirit of Judas and the Lord's persecutors, says, Let them be blotted blotted out of the book of the living and because they did not deserve to come to saving penitence because of the guilt of the great sin he subjoins and let them not be written among the righteous Amen? Let us see John Cassian also assured that Judas lost his salvation and was blotted out or erased from the book of life and he says Finally, in the case of Judas himself, the meaning of the prophetic curse was clearly fulfilled. For when his deadly sin was completed, he killed himself by hanging, that he might not, after his name was, his name, the name of Judas, was blotted out, be converted and repent and deserve to be once more written among the righteous in heaven. We must therefore no doubt that at the time when Judas was chosen by Christ and obtained a place in the apostolate, the name of Judas was written in the book of the living. And he, Judas, heard as well as the rest of the apostles the words of Jesus. Rejoice not because the devils are subject unto you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Judas was hearing that. Amen? But because 
he was Judas corrupted by the plague of covetousness and had his name struck out from the heavenly list it is suitably said of him and of men like him by the prophet O oh Lord let all those that forsake you thee be confounded and let them that depart from thee be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord the vein of the living waters and elsewhere they shall not be in the council of my people nor shall be written in the writing of the house of Israel of Israel neither shall they enter into the land of Israel clear my brothers and sisters clear Amen? I don't have any doubt. The early church used to believe, in this last point I'm going to preach for today. The early church used to believe that the Holy Spirit could be taken away from Christians or born again Christians who remain in sins. Amen? For example, the shepherd of Hermas, he wrote this letter in 80. 5 to 90 AD. He says, Here then, says, He foolish man, how grief crushes out the Holy Spirit or grief the Holy Spirit and on the other hand saves. Say, so how, how, how you who constantly grieve the Holy Spirit and be saved at the same time? No. Herma says, Both actions grief the Spirit doubt because it did not accomplish its object anger anger or anger grips the spirit because it did what was wicked both these are grievous to the holy spirit doubt and anger wherefore remove grief from you and crush not the Holy Spirit which dwells in you, lest he entreat God against you and he, the Holy Spirit, withdraw from you. It means depart from you. Clear or not, my brothers and sisters? Amen? Hermann the pastor understood that the Spirit can withdraw or be taken away from Christians who remain in anger and Herman the shepherd says here now he said how wicked is the action of anger and in what way it overthrows the servants of God by its action and turns them from righteousness to wickedness of course for when all these spirits dwell in one vessel in which the Holy Spirit also dwells in me in the spirit of anger these, the vessel cannot contain them, spirit of anger and the spirit of God, but overflows. The tender spirit then, not being accustomed to dwell with the wicked spirit, nor with hardness, with us from such a man. It must depart from such a person and seeks to dwell with meekness and peacefulness. Then, when he withdraws from the man in whom he dwell, the man is empty of the righteous spirit. And being henceforth filled with evil spirits, Matthew chapter 12, verse 45, he is not, he is in a state of anarchy and in every action, being dragged hither and thither by the evil spirits. And, he, and there is a complete darkness in his mind as to everything good. This then is what happens to all the angry. Notice, the tender spirit is not accustomed to dwell with the wicked spirit of anger. And that's why he departs from such a man. Amen? Athanasius of Alexandria taught that the Holy Spirit can depart from those Christians who don't repent as the Spirit of God departed from Saul, King Saul. Amen? We shall, excuse me? Okay, 
We shall be in the Son and in the Father, and we shall account it to have become one in Son and in Father. Because of that, that the Spirit is in us, which is in the world, which is in the Father. Then, when then a man falls from the Spirit for, of, for any wickedness, if he repent upon his fall, the grace remains irre irrevocably to such uh, as are willing Otherwise, if he does, doesn't repent, he who has fallen is no longer in God because the Holy Spirit and Paracletus, which is in God, has deserted him. But the sinner shall be in him to whom he has subjected himself as took place in Saul's instance for the Spirit of God departed from him and an evil spirit was afflicted him. Switch off. This is... Uh, this is... Hallelujah. Yes, yes. The red one. Hallelujah. We praise the name of Jesus. 